Welcome to a very special episode of Brain and Vat. What you're about to watch is a live recording of Jason and I presenting at our book launch. We produced a series of six books called Conversations About Philosophy, based on some of our favorite episodes of this show. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy copies of the book by clicking on the link in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jason and I run a philosophy podcast, which we've been doing for the last couple of years. And we have thousands of people that have watched episodes, but there's something so wonderful about having real life people that we can look in the eye and share our ideas with. And that's partly why we've made the books, is to be able to share our ideas in a way that's different from having a conversation on an audio show, on a radio show. And they're not just our ideas. What we did was to try and track down some of the greatest thinkers that the world has to offer. So you'll see that there are six different books. The book that has been out and out, the biggest seller, and the one that people have thoroughly enjoyed reading and was written alongside two of our closest friends, and we also happen to be the world leading experts on the topic, is this book on the meaning of life. So some of you may have heard of uh, Professor David Benatar. He's a professor at the University of Cape Town and has written one of the big critiques of this idea that you could have a meaningful life. He's famous for being what's called an antinatalist. Antinatalists take the view that it is better never to have been born, that the reason why you ought not to have children is not for the sort of things that environmentalists will tell you that it's bad for the planet, it's bad for animals, it's bad for other people. He says it's bad for you. He says it might not start off that way. It might be that if you're young and fit and you're looking like Jason and I, everything's great. But that at some point that curve will change, that things will get so grim that you'll say, I wish I was never born. And I think that every single person that is here tonight will have had that thought at some juncture where they'll say, Things are so bad that I wish I was never born. Maybe this is the kind of thing that you thought in the early days of the pandemic. You thought, the world is ending, the apocalypse has arrived, it would have been better if we were never born. But some of you will be very happy to hear that there is an antidote to Professor Benatar's pessimistic view about reality. When you spoke to Professor Dad Metz, who's written a book called Meaning in Life, published through Oxford University. And he thinks, what are the things that would make your life meaningful? Jason's probably better placed than me to tell you about this. So I'm not sure I am better placed, Mark. Do I have a more meaningful life? I'm not sure. But <laughs> so Benatar thinks that life is pretty much meaningless, especially if you consider life from a cosmic perspective. So he thinks that if you consider your day-to-day -day life, you interact with your family and your friends, you have some impact on them. But if you zoom out a bit and you zoom out to the level of your society, very few of us make an impact. And if you zoom up out a bit further to the level of humanity as a whole, and if you zoom out even further to the cosmic perspective where you look at us as tiny pale blue dots, we make no impact whatsoever on the cosmos. So David Benatar says life is pretty much meaningless. But Thaddeus Metz thinks there's a solution. He thinks our lives are meaningful if we consider not the cosmic perspective, but the perspective of our impact on the people around us. And he thinks that specifically our lives need to have three elements in order to be meaningful. They need to be good, beautiful, and true. We need to pursue goodness or morality, beauty or aesthetics, and truth as in knowledge. And if you pursue those three things in the right amounts, where one doesn't outweigh the others, you can lead a meaningful life. So you have these two titanic philosophers, Thaddeus Metz and David Benatar, who hold these opposing views. And the question is, which one is right? So we question both of them, object to both of them, and let them argue between each other. And the book contains some exclusive discussions between them that don't appear anywhere else. And they each explain why they think the other is wrong. And by the end of the book, it's for you to decide whether you think life is meaningful or not. So I mentioned that they're both very eminent philosophers. One of the reasons why we picked them to work with is that they both write incredibly beautifully, very clearly, and almost entirely avoid academic jargon. The idea with the books was to say, how do you introduce some of the greatest ideas that you know, these thinkers have to offer in a way that's actually accessible? And the format that we've adopted is this idea of a conversation, which is a rich history in philosophy. We think about Plato's dialogues, what you would have is a number of figures in a room talking it out, trying to work out 
What, what is valuable? What is true? How ought we to be? What are our obligations to others? And so we think that this method, first of all, is fun. A lot of people have said to us that they feel like they're part of this conversation, that they've read it out with their partners and played some of the roles and paused and put the book aside and said, what do you think about this? Have they asked a good question? What about this problem? So even though the books are short and you could really read them on a holiday, on a plane, while you're lying in the bath, they're accessible books, you could also contemplate on them, sit with them, and think about them, debate them. You know, philosophers think that uh, arguments are very important. We don't think that arguments are like what you have with your spouse, you're not throwing dishes at each other's heads. You're trying to use this method to find out what's actually true. Most of the people that we interviewed are not South Africans. So we've managed to speak to some of the greatest thinkers from all around the world. I mentioned this idea of our obligations to others. And so we have this book called Harming Animals, which is about what our obligations are to animals and to each other. And there's a couple of big issues that people have. One of them is on this question of, is it moral to eat meat? I think it's become more and more a part of people's conversations. You think about South Africa 25 years ago, if you were a vegetarian, you basically got the stuff that came next to the steak. Now you can go to the stairs and you're going to get a Beyond Burger that's made out of all sorts of interesting plants and tastes like a piece of beef. And that's partly because you've had this ethical movement. And so we talk to someone who tries to make the claim for why it might be wrong to eat and we put various objections. Is it about the rearing of the animals? Is it about the killing of the animals? Does your private choice make a difference? Is it like voting? So you might think symbolically, I've picked a political party that I believe in, I go to the ballot box and I choose them. But actually your vote has no effect on the outcome of the election whatsoever. So is it being part of a movement, it's more of a symbolic activity than the kind of thing that you're obliged to do? But the book doesn't just touch on whether you should eat meat, but has other questions around animal ethics. Is it okay to have pets? Uh, what about zoo creatures? Yeah, so something you'll notice in the format of these books is that they're always debates. So we don't present one view. And Mark and I disagree on pretty much everything. So Mark is a pescatarian. He doesn't eat meat. And I do eat meat. And the guest that we had on for one of the articles in the Harming Animals book, Dustin Crummett, is one of the world's most famous vegetarians. And he thinks that it is definitely wrong to eat meat. And he and Mark pile up on me during this during the discussion. But for those of you who eat meat, I'm confident to, to, to tell you that you can. It's fine. And if you want to, to protect your meat-eating habits, then it's a good idea to read the Harming Animals book. Um, so there's interesting questions around animals, uh, which is an ethical question. So what is right or wrong? We love ethical questions because ethical questions are very unclear and murky. Very few, everyone seems to be very clear in their own heads what's right and wrong. The problem is our heads disagree. So we focused on a number of different books where ethics is applied. So one of the books we looked at is on lockdowns. So we wrote the book just when lockdowns were implemented. Um, and that's when we started our channel. It seemed like a very good opportunity to engage in philosophical discourse when the world was going to part. And uh, the question that we asked at the time was, are lockdowns unethical? And we asked it hypothetically. So at the time, there was very little information about COVID and how serious it was and how efficacious vaccines would ultimately be. We asked, well, if you had a very, very serious disease, even if you think that was COVID or if you think it was COVID, hypothetically, if you had a very serious disease, how serious would it need to be in order to lock down? And we thought the question about whether you should lock down should be understood as what's called a trolley problem. So it's a thought experiment that philosophers use to ex explore a lot of different ethical dilemmas. So the trolley problem is basically this. You've got this trolley or this train. The trolley problem was initially a Canadian problem, so they call them trolleys. But it's a train, okay. So you've got this train and it's chugging along a track. And on this track are five people. There's five people on this track, they chain to the track. And if you just let this train go, it's gonna hit and kill these five people. Or you can pull a lever, and when you pull that lever, the train diverts to another track but kills one person. And the question is, should you, kill, should you pull that lever and inadvertently, or some would say advertently, kill the other person? Should you sacrifice one to save five? And the arguments around lockdowns is very much that. Should you harm certain people and undermine their freedoms in order to save other people? Should you pull the lever? So we explore this trolley problem and how it applies to lockdowns. 
as well as other areas. So the lockdown book is really a trolley problem. And secondly, in that book, we look at political legitimacy. So the one question, is it moral to pull the lever? Is it moral to lock down? The other question, is it politically legitimate? What sort of role should government have in our lives? Should government have the ability to stop our movement? Should government have the ability to tell us what to do on a daily basis? So one of the features of books is that each chapter opens with thought experiments, a real life case, something that you can use in this imaginative way and say, if I have an intuition about what we should do in this case, how is it going to affect how I think about a broader topic? There's a variant of the trolley problem. So most people say, oh, it's a simple thing. One versus five, you allow the one to die. The variant is this. What if it's not that you're the train driver who can pull the lever? What if you're standing on a bridge and you can see the train heading towards these five people. And there's a very, very overweight guy standing on the bridge next to you. Look at him and you think, you know, I pushed this guy over the bridge. He's fat enough that he'll stop the train. Is it okay to murder him to save these five people? And then people start to get more and more uncomfortable. They go, no, I don't think it's okay to kill that guy. And so there's these interesting questions about what is it that motivates our moral reasoning? How much of it has to do with how vivid the case is. If you think about this idea of locking down, we could imagine two very vivid scenarios. The idea of people being ravaged by health disease, dying in overflowing hospital beds. And then you've got this more abstract thing about people losing their jobs, the economy being ruined, things that are harder to tell. One of the things that Jason talks about is to say, maybe there aren't other people on the tracks. It's just lots of valuable items, people's pianos and the books that they sell, the book dealers. Those are the things that are gonna get ridden over by the train. Maybe we feel more comfortable with that. What's interesting is this political legitimacy question is, I think if you spot checked people at various times, people's initial intuitions were, the government must totally do this. Thank you, thank you for leading us, for instituting this strong ban for not allowing people to leave their homes. Wonderful leadership. Now people feel more uncomfortable with that. They look at what's happening in China and they say the terror COVID policy is completely nuts. It's completely illegitimate. This is done by fascists, totalitarians. How dare they let one of these people leave their homes? And so having some kind of framework where you can actually determine what's right, what's wrong, what government should do to us generally is useful. And that's what we've tried to build up in the book, but only using, as I say, clear language and avoiding technical terms. One of the books that's closest to my heart is this book on love and desire. So we got the guy on the philosophy of love, Roger Holwani, who's become a very good friend of ours, exceptionally funny, has been editing a collected essay, a volume for a very long time, written one of the big books on love, marriage and sex, and talks about some of the ethical questions and some of the underlying questions. Do we know what love is? Is the love that you feel for a friend or a parent different from the love that you feel romantically? Can you be in love with someone who's abusive? The case that he starts off with is of someone who's being beaten up by her boyfriend. Basically, she keeps going back to him and her friend says to her, but why? She says, well, I love him, he loves me. And this is how he expresses his love, this toxic love, and whether we can understand that to really be love. We then also talk about different kinds of romantic relationships that people can have. So I'll hand this over to Jason. Are we obliged to be monogamous or are there other ways we can be? Yeah, so Raja Hawani considers the possibility of polyamory, whether it is morally okay. And then the bigger question, whether it would constitute love at all. So one of the big dilemmas in philosophy is whether you can only love one romantic partner. So I think traditionally for a long time, a lot of people believe that it is impossible. It is logically impossible to love two people romantically. You can only love one. And Raja considers that argument and the reasons you might hold that and the reasons you might think that's incorrect. And I'm not going to give you the answer. And there isn't an answer. I think there is an answer. But the point is that there isn't a clear answer that we give in the book. There's just different options and different arguments for those options. And you have to decide for yourself. So one of the arguments for why it would be impossible to love two people is that it seems like if you were to love more than one person, you wouldn't be loving them for their substance, their soul. Feel a lot of people believe, and there's a religious belief, that it's impossible to love two souls, that your soul only has a match with one other. And we consider that argument, and whether love really is a matter of loving another person's soul, or whether instead you love another person's properties. In other words, their qualities. Are they funny? Are they tall? Are they beautiful? 
Are they intelligent? Are those the things you love? But if those are the things you love and not their soul, then it seems like if someone else comes along who's just as funny and tall and beautiful and clever, then you should love them just as much. So there's these interesting arguments about whether monogamy makes sense, whether polyamory is possible, and whether it would constitute true love. Another question is around the morality of certain sexual desires. So for a long time, humans believed that certain types of sexual desires were immoral. So it was very much baked into our religions and our culture that certain types of sexual attractions, like for example, homosexual sexual attractions were immoral. And today, very few people hold that, but we still seem to think that certain other types of sexual attractions are immoral. And it's often those people who are very liberal around, let's say, homosexual desire, who are illiberal about certain other desires. For example, let's say I hold a racist sexual desire. So let's say I'm only attracted to members of one race and not of another race. Some people think that that's immoral. Back then, you might say to them, can we, are we in a position to judge and to say to people, you are obligated to have certain types of sexual desires and not other types of sexual desires? If we say that and we think that race sexual desires are immoral, then it seems like we're guiding people's sexual desires in the same ways that we did for many generations past that we no longer do. So there's very interesting dilemmas here around the morality of sexual desires. So Jason touched on this idea of soulmates. And one of the topics that we discuss in the books is around the existence of God. I think it's one of those things that everybody at some point will have grapple with. And we look at it through a very particular lens, which is traditionally referred to as the problem of evil. So we live in a world where there can be immense suffering, suffering performed by other people. So people who will engage in the genocide, who will torture others, rape them, kill them. But then there's other kinds of suffering that you can have. Plagues, natural disasters. And the idea is that if God is meant to have certain fundamental attributes, like being all powerful or good and all knowing, the question is, how does God reconcile the suffering? So if God is all-powerful, God could do something about the suffering. God could ensure that we don't have that in our world. And it seems that to be all-powerful and all-good would require a choice, that maybe God can't have both of those attributes. And so we speak to one of the world's most famous atheists, Graham Oppie. One of the things that Graham is famous for is having this very polite discussion, very open. He's well-liked by theists who will say that Graham will disagree with you in a way that doesn't demean you. Something that we try and do in all our discussions is to say, we want to try and put the best version of this argument forward so that you can truly grapple with it, but we'll never attack a guest for holding a view. We'll never attack who they are or demean someone. We want to try and find out what's good. Is the argument any good? The other part of the book is written by a philosopher and a rabbi, Sam Niebitz. And Sam has a fascinating view on it. It's a very novel way of solving the problem of evil, a problem that has perplexed people for thousands of years. He says, I agree, it cannot be the case that God could be all powerful and all good. He doesn't take the move that, well, maybe all the suffering that you think is actually good for you in some kind of way, God works in numerous ways. He says, no, 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 I don't buy that at all. But he says, there's another way in which the problem can be solved. And I'll let Jason explain. So Sam Edens thinks that what will happen at the end of time is that God will review history. So God will look at how the world has evolved and God will say, there were these segments that I don't like. So these bits of suffering and these bits of war and these bits that I don't like, there were some nice parts, these bad parts, and God will review history as if it were a film. So like a script for a film. And he'll say, we need to retake the bad parts. We need to rewind all the way to the beginning cut out the bad parts and replay and let humans make choices again. And then we'll let history play out and at the end of time we'll see there's maybe a few fewer bad parts. So there's still some bad parts but not as many as before. So we'll chop those out and rewind to the beginning and let history play again. And we'll keep doing that infinitely until there's no bad parts, until history is clean, there's no suffering. And that's the final cut. That's the movie that comes out. That is the world. And so, on Sam Lieben's view, he thinks that suffering will never have happened. 
Right now, it seems like when you wake up in the morning and you've got a dead leg, but in the next cut, when you wake up in the morning, it won't be sore, right? And at the end of time, when we look back in history, the scene where your leg was sore when you got out of bed isn't there. So Sam even says, it just appears that there's suffering, but there won't be at the end of time. And so there isn't this problem of suffering or evil for theism or for those that believe that God exists. Yeah, so this analogy of God as a filmmaker, we found fascinating and it's a really novel view and this idea that you have just drafting notes right now, that none of this is actually truly real, that we only get to be in the final cut and if you're doing terrible things enough, well maybe you just won't make the final cut, that's your incentive to do good things. But we push against Sam's view and we try and interrogate. But this idea of philosophy and film is something that we find incredibly powerful. A lot of people's first introductions to these taxing ideas or things that are mysterious comes through cinema. And the last book that we have called Time Travel and Teleporters deals with this fusion of film and philosophy. So everyone in this room will have watched some movie about time travel and they'll have wondered, is this possible? And there's different ways in which we can talk about it being possible. The one is, do we have the technology to create a DeLorean that can, once it goes to 88 miles an hour, we'll go back to 1950. Uh, and the other one, is it philosophically possible? Can we logically talk about going back in time? Is it possible to change the past? And there's a great philosophical literature on this. There's some very interesting questions about which of those time travel movies are really in the realm of magic and which of them are in the realm of possibility. Jason is also the biggest contributor to this book because it contains a wonderful collection of essays that he's written on some of the most exotic and spicy bits of sci-fi form that have been created and he draws out all the philosophical essence from it. I'll let him talk about that. So the, the big one that many people know about, even if you haven't watched a lot, is Star Trek, right? Star Trek has a ton of philosophy. There's some great stuff in there. The new Star Trek has less philosophy in it than the old Star Trek, but it's all rich. And one of the big problems in Star Trek is whether you can have two of you at once. So in philosophy, or well, in Star Trek rather, there's the teleporter, right? So you step onto the transport of the teleporter pad and it dematerializes you. And then you beam up to the ship or you beam down to the planet and they rematerialize you there. And it seems like you stepped onto the platform and you stepped off another platform far away and it's still you. But the question is, what happens when the teleporter goes wrong? So you step onto the transporter pad and then you step off on the planet but they forget to dematerialize you on the, te the transporter pad so now there's two of you and there are star trek episodes like this now there's two of you now the question is which one is you and that's quite hard to answer and the answer to that question seems to lie in whether we identify you with your mind or your body so the body that's stepping on the transporter pad is the same body that was there initially. And the body on the planet is a new body, but with the same mind. Do we think that you're now two people, in which case we think you're identifying with your mind, or do we think you're just one person, the person still standing on the original transporter pad, in which case who you are is your body. And whichever way you answer, we then gonna throw new problems at you, new thought experiments which challenge that view. So Star Trek is a very rich, example of philosophical problems and we consider quite a few different cases from star trek there's lots of other fantastic movies there's one called the lobster so the lobster is all about the problem of love and in the lobster the question is can you fall in love with a person's identity regardless of their physical form so if your partner became a lobster would you love them and I suppose you became a lobster too so you and your partner were both transformed into lobsters would you love each other still just as much so is love species transcendent? We consider lots of different movies, science fiction movies, because they offer such interesting, rich philosophical questions. 